Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in Spring Creek, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark starts with these words, this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's clear, in the first few chapters, the focus is about Jesus Christ. It keeps revealing, Mark keeps revealing about who Jesus is. In the very first instance, when John the Baptist comes, he shows how Jesus is greater than John the Baptist, that he's a greater baptizer. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit when John the Baptist baptizes with water only. And then you also see Jesus himself being baptized, anointed with the Holy Spirit, which means, which shows that he is Christ, the anointed one. And then he goes on, shows that he is the great physician when he calls Levi. He has come not to heal the healthy, but for the sick. And then in the questioning of fasting, he shows that he is the bridegroom so that the disciples don't have to fast. The bridegroom is here. And also in the controversy with Sabbath, he says that he is the Lord of Sabbath. Therefore, disciples can pluck some the head of the grain. And also in this text, he reveals that he is the one who has come to bind Satan I do think that is the main point of this passage, but I must confess there's something extremely distracting in this chapter, in this passage, and that is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This topic is like a black hole. It has so much gravitational pull that even though I try to focus on what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done for me, I found myself keep asking what exactly is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit against the Holy Spirit, and how can I avoid that? It pulls our attention away from what's main, and I bet when you hear about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, you're curious about that as well. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is unforgivable, it's unpardonable. So we can't help but be attracted and start wondering about what that is. So we'll allow that in the sermon. We'll have, we'll have as our theme, Jesus came to bind Satan, but we'll first deal with the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the first point is accusing Jesus of the opposite. Jesus came to bind Satan, but accusing him of the opposite might lead to damnation. Sorry about that. It's, it's entirely, has entirely changed. The first point will be accusing Jesus, him of the opposite, might lead to damnation. And second is recognizing that Jesus came to bind Satan leads to gratitude. The first point is accusing Jesus of the opposite might lead to damnation. And you, see, you can see that's what's happening in our text. Jesus in verse 27 tells in a parable that he has come to bind Satan. But the scribes accused him of the exact opposite. Instead of Jesus binding Satan, instead of Jesus having control over Satan, the scribes accused him of being bound by Satan, by being possessed by Satan. So this makes Jesus warn them in verses 28 to 30. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And again, notice in verse 30, the reason why Jesus is saying this is, is because, for they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. The first point I said this, this might lead to damnation. And I say might because I'm not sure whether the scribes have already blasphemed Jesus by saying this, or they are really, really close to it. It might be that Jesus is telling them, you are going down a very dangerous road. You're awfully getting close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's why I said it might lead to damnation. And there's uncertainty there. And I'm afraid there will be a lot of uncertainties in our sermon today. That's because the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is one of the most difficult topics in the Bible. I've tried my best to get some clarity on this, but in fact, no one seems to know exactly 
what that is. They have their opinions, but there's no consensus. And I'm going to share with you what I know for sure. I'm going to stick close to the text while expanding here and there to make it applicable to you. Now, if it's such a difficult subject, why are we dealing with this at all? Because this seems to be uh, something that burdens people. And some of you will be greatly comforted, comforted by knowing as much as you can about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Even as we were introduced to this topic in the seminary, Dr. Rembley started his class by sharing his pastoral case, a pastoral case that he had to deal with. In his congregation was an elderly member, a brother in the church. He was upright. He had served as an elder multiple times in the church. Yet on, and during one visit, he confessed that he wasn't sure whether he was saved. And that was because he thought that he had committed the unforgivable sin, that he thought he had blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And that's because during the war, he was involved with the war, and during an intense time, a time out of anger and desperation, he took the name of the Lord in vain. And he did that once. And he weighed heavy on him. He thought he had blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, and I've heard more cases of members, faithful members, struggling against this, whether they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit or not, whether they are saved or not because of this. So it's worth gaining clarity on this topic. And as we begin, I want to share something that's crucial and vital. And there might be a lot of unknowns in this text and in this sermon, but... There seems to be one thing that is certain. All commentaries and all the ministers that I consulted with did say one thing in common, and I want you to fix this in your mind firmly as we proceed. And it's this. If you're concerned whether you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, you have not blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And that's because someone who has blasphemed against the Holy Spirit will not care about it. The reason you're concerned is because you believe there is someone such as the Holy Spirit. You believe you do have faith, and you do believe in forgiveness, and you want forgiveness. And how would you, or why would you want that? Why would you care about that if there's no faith? And how would you know that, that the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in you, working faith in you? So if you're concerned about whether you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit or not, and you don't have to be concerned that you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes, whoever has faith, has forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Jesus Christ. So with that assurance, let's proceed and ask what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. And this is how we're going to approach. We're going to first rule out what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not. And we can do that on the basis of verse 28. Verse 29, he says, Christ says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. It's an unforgivable sin. So, if we know that a type of sin or a sin is forgivable, we can rule it out that that, that is not the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we'll narrow down our options. So we'll start with listing or going through what is not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. First, blasphemy itself, or taking the name of the Lord in vain itself, is not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is more specific than that. And you can be sure of this because we have an example who did blaspheme God but received forgiveness. And that person is well known to us, and it's none, none other than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, Formerly, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
Paul blasphemed. He was a blasphemer, but he received mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. So just because someone blasphemes God doesn't mean that he cannot be forgiven. And this fits with what Christ said in this text. In verse 28, he said, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Note that Christ said, whatever blasphemies they uttered will be forgiven. So even if you have blasphemed against God, even if you've taken the name of the Lord in vain, either in word or deed, if you confess and if you repent, there is forgiveness of sins. Any blasphemies uttered against God will be forgiven, said Christ. Second, continuing, on, continuing with what is not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Just because you have sinned intentionally doesn't mean that you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Some of you might have the idea that unintentional sins are forgivable, but intentional sins, something that's done deliberately, cannot be forgiven. And that might be based on an Old Testament passage, which I think was poorly translated. And I'll give you an example why that is the case. We do have examples of people who've sinned intentionally who are forgiven. Think about David. David had that terrible sin with Bathsheba, and then he tried to cover up his sin. And that's that aspect we want to focus on. When he tried to cover up his sin, did he do that intentionally, or was that unintentional? Think of how he first had Uriah brought back from the battlefield, and he tried to send him home so they can spend the night with his wife. That is so that because Bathsheba was pregnant and he could be seen as, as Uriah's son or child if he sleeps with his wife. But Uriah refused and that didn't work. And then David called Uriah again, made him drunk, sent him home, but that didn't work either. And as a last resort, David ordered the army, the troops to place Uriah in the front of the battle and in the, during the thick of the battle to retreat so that Uriah will be killed and it will make, look like an accident. There was a lot of planning going on in there, isn't it? The whole process would have taken about a week, calling him from the battlefield, making him drunk, sending him back to the battlefield. So are we going to look at that and say that wasn't intentional? That was unintentional? I think it was intentional. It was premeditated. He carefully planned that. So he committed an intentional sin. He, he sinned deliberately, deliberately. And if he could not be forgiven, so if intentional sins couldn't be forgiven, then God could not forgive David. But we know that God did forgive David. God sent the Nathan, Nathan the prophet to David and when David confessed his sins, Nathan the prophet told him, The Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. So you see that even if someone commits sin intentionally, there is forgiveness of sin. And that should be a comfort to you. Even if you've committed sin intentionally, which we do, even if you've gone out your way to plan to sin, and you did sin, that doesn't necessarily mean that your sin is unforgivable. It does not mean that you've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. So confess your sin and receive the forgiveness of sin. And thirdly, just because you have committed a serious crime, a, a grievous sin, doesn't mean that you've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And we have a whole list of those who have sinned terribly. David, as we've seen, committed adultery. Moses killed a man. The sons of Israel were terrible people. That's the patriarchs, the people of God. Levi and Simeon wiped out a whole, all the men of a tribe, the Shechem. They committed human trafficking by selling Joseph as a slave. 
Those were terrible sins, but all those were forgiven. So we've gone through these three aspects, whether it's intentional, whether it's blasphemy, whether it's terrible sins, grievous sins, but none of these aspects alone seems to make a sin the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It seems that there is a combination of aspects that makes a sin blasphemous against the Holy Spirit. So what exactly is it? What can we know about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit from this text? And let's take a closer look at our passage. What exactly did the scribes do to make Jesus warn them in this way? Read in verse 22 that they were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. Beelzebul is another name for Satan. This becomes clear in the way Jesus responds to them. He right away talks about how can Satan cast out Satan. So Beelzebul, the prince of demons, is Satan. So they're saying that Jesus is possessed by Satan. And from this we can know, know the couple of things. First, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is intentional. It's malicious. It's full of evil intent. It's not done out of weakness. It's drastically, drastically different from taking the name of the Lord in vain out of frustration or anger or desperation. The scribes are not acting out of weakness. It's not as if their spirit is willing but their flesh is weak. It's not as if they wanted to praise Jesus but it somehow came out wrong, saying that he was possessed by Beelzebul. No, were they manipulated to say this. They weren't incited. There was no some kind of psychology, psychology of mob going on here. In fact, they were the ones inciting the crowds. They were going against the majority. The crowd were gathered. They were gathered to be healed by Jesus. They, had, they thought highly of Jesus, but these men, these scribes, wanted to accuse Jesus. They wanted to offend Jesus. Their goal was to smear Jesus, to sow doubts in people's minds so that they would stop following Jesus. And that's because they were scribes, the religious elites. They felt threatened because of the influence, the growing influence of Jesus Christ. And were most likely, they were allied with the Pharisees and Herodians who appear in verse 6 of this chapter, who were who counseled together to destroy Jesus. They're br- bringing this accusation so that they could have Jesus arrested. So you see that they were full of evil intent. And secondly, this was done publicly. This wasn't a speculation that ha- they had in their minds or in their hearts. They weren't wondering about it. It wasn't as if they said this among themselves, among the scribes privately, trying to figure out who Jesus was. They've already made up their mind. They had malicious intent, and they are publicly accusing Jesus that he was possessed by Beelzebul. I notice that, thirdly, this was a repeated action. It was a repeated offense. Look at verse 22. You read that the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he's possessed by Beelzebul. You don't read that they had said this or they said this. No, you read that they were saying, which means they didn't say it once. They said it over and over again. They kept saying that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebul. And fourth, they are lying. But their lie is a terrible lie. Any lie will be terrible, but you could give half truth or omit some facts. But they're saying the exact opposite of the truth. They're saying that he's possessed, Jesus is possessed by Satan. Let me give you an example of what I mean by they could have told a lesser lie. They could have said that Jesus is a powerful prophet, but he is not the son of God. That would be a terrible lie. But it's not as bad as what they're saying. 
they could have said that Jesus is casting on demons by the power of demons, as in like he's not accessing Satan himself, the prince of demons, but he's using some evil spirits. But that's not what they're saying. They say, they said that he is possessed by Beelzebul. As if Jesus has no free will, he's an instrument of Satan. He's possessed by him. You know how people, how people are described when they're possessed by a demon. They're foaming in their mouths. They have no, almost no free will. They're totally in control of Satan. That's what the scribes are accusing Jesus of. He's possessed by Satan. Not, not that he's allied with Satan, not that he's using his power. He's possessed by Satan. And that's exactly the opposite, exactly opposite of the truth. In the spectrum of lies, that would be the worst that you could say. Nothing could be literally farther from the truth. Was Jesus possessed by Satan? Not at all. In fact, he was so full of the Holy Spirit, who is exactly the opposite of Satan. He was so full of the Holy Spirit that he is going to baptize others with the Holy Spirit. When he was anointed, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven in the form of a dove. There was no one on this earth who was more filled with the Holy Spirit than Jesus was. Yet the scribes are telling a malicious lie, something that's exactly opposite from the truth, that he is possessed by Satan. They were lying to the worst degree. And that gives us some sense of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. To bring all these aspects together, they were publicly, repeatedly, intentionally spreading a lie that was exactly opposite from the truth. And that's what made Jesus warn them about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid that's as far as I can go with the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I can get into too much detail of what exactly it is because the text doesn't do that. Jesus didn't tell us. Jesus, Jesus does not define in our text what exactly the blasphemy of, against the Holy Spirit is. And I think it's wise for us to leave what is vague as vague rather than inquisitively prying into mysteries. In humility, let's not make what is unclear and vague artificially clear. That is as far as we can go with the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Yet I do not want to overlook that there is a serious warning here. Jesus is saying that there is such thing as an unpardonable sin, an unforgivable sin. And that should be a warning to us all. Especially if you are living in sin, if you are enjoying sin, if you are rebelling against God, if you hate Christ, if you want to lead people away from Christ, you should be warned. Know that there is such thing as a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And those who commit that never has forgiveness. And since we've saw that, we've seen that the blasphemy of, against the Holy Spirit has something to do with persistent sins, intentional sin. Let me bring in Romans 1. From there, you see that if you persist in your sin intentionally, rebelling against God, and you keep suppressing the truth, there is a point where God will give you over to the lust of your heart. If you're playing with sin, if you live a, lead a sinful lifestyle, you are jeopardizing your soul. And that's you. Don't ever think that I'm going to sin today and I'm repent. I'll repent tomorrow. What makes you think that you can sin today and repent tomorrow? Aren't you assuming that there will be a tomorrow for you? Or aren't you assuming that you will have somehow the willpower to turn your life around as if you are capable of repentance? Don't be so sure that you will not be addicted to sin, that you will not be enslaved to sin. I don't know when, when it will be in each of your lives, but there is a point when God will give you over 
to your sinful desires. There's a point where you will be unforgivable. There is such a thing as a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I've warned you, I've warned you as a guest minister, and I'm sure your minister and your elders and deacons and your brothers will warn you again and again. And rightly so, I've warned you, and your blood is on your head. So repent. Turn to God. Ask for forgiveness. While I do want to note that there's a strong warning, a serious warning, I still want to end with it again by reminding you that if you are concerned that you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, by that very fact, you should not be concerned. You have not blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. You have faith. The Holy Spirit is living in you. You cannot blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. By faith, your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. As Christ says in our verse, in our text, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man. And that's why Jesus Christ came into this world to give forgiveness of sins to us. And that brings us to the second point. Recognizing this, meaning recognizing that Jesus came to bind Satan, leads to gratitude. The binding of Satan has a direct impact in your life. It has a direct impl implication for your forgiveness of sins. If Jesus didn't bind Satan, you would not know the gospel. You will be still deceived by Satan, not knowing that there is the gospel or the truth. If Satan wasn't bound, you wouldn't know about Jesus Christ. You wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, you would not receive the forgiveness of sins. And we read about the impact of binding Satan in Revelation chapter 20. There, Satan is bound, thrown into the pit, sealed, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. That means before, when Satan was free, before he was bound, he had freedom to deceive the nations, but Jesus put a stop to that on the cross. Jesus reveals himself to be the one who binds Satan, and that's in verse 27. He says that no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then indeed he may plunder his house. What's clear from this parable is that, yeah, well, first, the strong man is Satan and that he has come to bind Satan. It doesn't tell you when exactly Satan was bound. We don't exactly know when he was bound. But we know that this is something that happened during his ministry. And we can learn exactly when or about the timeline of, of when Satan was bound. When Paul talks about the cross in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, when he talks about the record of death being nailed on the cross, he writes this, that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. From this verse, we can know that on the cross, at least Jesus bound Satan. And that's because of the word triumph by triumphing over them. Do you know what a triumph is? What is a triumph? Often we use it interchangeably, interchangeably with victory. With victory, we use it as the same word as victory. We say we triumphed over someone. We, we had victory over someone. A triumph was something more specific than that. It was a technical word. It was a specific ceremony, a parade. It was a victory parade. That, that took place after a general conquers a tribe, a nation, and then he will put enemies in chains and force them to parade. And that's the idea. That's what Jesus did. When Jesus defeated Satan and the demons on the cross, he forced them, they, he bound them up and forced them to go on the parade so that everyone can see. That's why he says in this text, 
in this verse, Colossians 2, verse 15, that Jesus put them to open shame. They're on the parade being, so that everyone can see that they were defeated. That's why the easy-to-read version translates Colossians 2, verse 15 like this. He defeated the rulers and powers of the spiritual world with the cross. He won the victory over them and led them away as defeated and powerless prisoners for the whole world to see. So, Jesus triumphed over them, meaning Satan was bound, and then Jesus dragged him around to show the world that he had defeated and bound Satan. So on the cross, we know that Jesus bound Satan. That means, for, for us right now, Jesus, sorry, Satan is bound. Jesus bound Satan. He is bound. That also means that right now he cannot deceive the nations any longer. Note that the deceiving of the nations is not a future event. It's something that happened in the past. I'm not saying that Satan does not have any power to deceive anymore, but his power is limited. He can no longer deceive the nations as he used to. By the deceiving of the nations, we're not talking about someone or some group taking over media and manipulating the entire world. That's, again, taking this as a future event. And this is something that happened in the past. Deceiving of the nations it was a description of the world before Christ was crucified. Satan is no longer able to deceive the nations with his lies, and that's because the truth went out from Judea, from Golgotha. Satan cannot deceive the nations with his lies anymore because the gospel has gone out. The truth of the gospel has been spread out to the nations. Nations were, they'd never heard of the gospel. They weren't God's people, but they were included after the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus freed them from the deception through the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, by sending out his apostles, by establishing churches, by sending preachers, So Satan cannot overcome the gospel anymore. He cannot deceive the nations. That's how you know the truth. And this this should lead us to thankfulness because, especially because we are not Israelites by birth. You are part of the nations. You You are a Gentile by nature. Spiritually, you are Israelites. So that means if Jesus did not bind Satan on the cross, you would not know the gospel. You would still be under deception. And who knows what kind of deceptions you'll be under. Maybe you would think that life is meaningless and you suffer from it because you think that everything came about by chance. Maybe you would think that life is about pleasure, it's about sex and drugs. And you'll never know that there's something more meaningful than that, that there's a spiritual reality even. Maybe you believe that you have to earn your salvation, that you have to work hard to earn the forgiveness of sins, and you'll be oppressed by that false doctrine. But that's not the case for you because Jesus bound Satan, and he cannot deceive you any longer. Through the gospel, now your eyes have been opened to see that you have a loving Father, that you have a loving Savior. And thanks to Christ binding Jesus, you know the wonderful gospel and you know that all your sins are forgiven. You even know that the blasphemies that you uttered will be forgiven because Jesus died for you. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what it means that he bound Satan on our behalf. So may you you put your trust in him and be freed from all the power of of the devil. Amen.